now next we are having uh, Melanie Berg from Psyched Up North joining us. She is a registered school psychologist and a UNBC School of Education faculty member. So I'd like to welcome Melanie Berg to join us today and her presentation. Hi, everybody. Excellent. Um, I just have to say right off the bat that I am battling COVID, <laughs> but I'm not letting it keep me down. So I will do my best to present as much as I can today, but you can probably hear it in my in my voice. I don't normally sound this sultry, <laughs> but uh, anyways, I will do my best if I if I have to mute myself to, to cough or, you know, um, stop my video. It's it's usually because I'm having a cough attack or something and no one needs to see that. So um, I will do my best to, to get through everything I can. I did change my presentation up a little bit at the last minute to get some help from some videos. Um, so some of the things that I really wanted to explain um, in more detail, I'm relying on, on some other expert, experts, uh, more expert than I am, um, to do that just to save my voice a bit. So I do have some video links. I sure hope they all work. But anyways, bear with me today. And I apologize for all the, I'm sure, the stopping that is going to happen <laughs> of my screen and my presentation. So um, I guess I will share my screen. Let's do that. Okay, are you seeing that presentation? Seeing my PowerPoint? Yes, it's good to go, Mal. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Great. Okay, I just want to bring the chat back up on there. There we go. And I think I'll have some help monitoring the chat too, right? I appreciate that very much. Don't worry about the chat and the questions and answers. I will take care of that. Okay, I'm going to just get it off my screen then and not distract myself from that. Okay. All right. So um, there was a, a, a look like a, a repeat. And I, I know that happens. I'm the queen of typos. So there probably will be some in mind as well. But my topic is actually literacy, self-regulation and trauma, what every educator needs to know. And this will be just a brief introduction because every um, aspect of, of this is a presentation in itself. So it's really just a brief introduction and um, hopefully plants some seeds and gives people um, some avenues to be able to find out and learn more. But I do wanna acknowledge that I'm coming to uh, this presentation from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Shoshone peoples and home of the Williams Lake First Nation. It's a beautiful sunny day here in, in Williams Lake, which I have not been outside to enjoy <laughs> for days. Um, so a little bit of background about me. I think it's really important for uh, people to understand the lens that I'm coming to this from. So I am a settler, Canadian uh, third or fourth generation of Irish and French heritage. I was born in Ontario, but I grew up in BC. I spent all of my educational years here. Uh, most of that on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Stalo peoples. So my main time growing up was spent in Mission, and it is the home of the last functioning residential school in BC. It closed in 1984 when I was in high school, because I'm, I'm that old. <laughs> um, but it's important to recognize that because I, it was very near to the school that I went to. St. Mary's is very near uh, to my home. Um, I had friends that, that, uh, that was a part of their upbringing and their, their life growing up. And I always was really curious and had a lot of questions about that. Uh, it shaped me. It shaped uh, part of, of, of the questions that I'm asking now um, that I've continued to ask as, a, as I've become an educator. Uh, it's just something that's important to, to recognize as a part of my lens. So after high school, I, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I actually thought I might want to be a, a journalist. And I went in and did a media communications um, a degree from Simon Fraser University and had a minor in psychology. But it was working with youth, um, homeless youth through three family services after I completed my BA. And then I was a career advisor at high school as well. That's really what pushed me into this field of education. And I, it never occurred to me to go down that road, even though I was advising students about 
you know, what to do with the rest of their lives, it never occurred to me to become a teacher. So I had a, a fantastic principal at the time, a bit of a BC celebrity, Dr. Linda Kayser. And she, um, she said, you know, what are you doing? You need to, you're, you've got your BA, you really should be um, looking at becoming a teacher. And so that's really what started it all. But before I came to that decision, I had already seen and uh, exactly what our, our previous speaker, Dr. Siegel, was, was talking about, I had witnessed that. You know, I had noticed that a lot of the students that I worked with that had so many struggles in their lives had also had difficulty with literacy. Um, and, and I think it's really important to recognize that having difficulty with, li with literacy, it's not a, a black or white, you either have dyslexia or you don't. Um, it's a continuum, right? So people can struggle with literacy in various ways. They can struggle with the writing aspect. Um, you can be literate, you can access print, but it may be very labored. It may be something that you struggle to do. So even if you can read, how efficiently can you read? How effective are you with, with your ability to read? Um, is it something that you enjoy? And, and a lot of people who can um, read well, don't necessarily enjoy reading for, for a number of different reasons. So all of these are, are things that I was witnessing and seeing in, in youth that struggled with school. Um, that literacy aspect seemed to be a common denominator. So I became a teacher. Um, I went to SFU. I had an intermediate focus and a learning disabilities focus. And what I mean by that is that any opportunity where we had electives, um, I was I knew that I wanted to learn more about why some students struggle in particular why students, some students struggle with reading. So that was a, a big focus for me. Um, I became uh, right from the beginning of my career, I had pieces of learning assistance or learning resource jobs and um, went back to um, UBC and obtained a two year baccalaureate special education diploma. I completed that in 2003, again, very much with that focus on wanting to understand how we learn to read and why do some students struggle. I never really quite felt like I got the answers. It was always um, very much about, well, it doesn't really matter what kind of program, you just want to surround kids with rich literature and make sure you're giving them plenty of opportunity, try to make reading enjoyable, all of those things, but it really the message was it doesn't matter what kind of programming you use or what kind of approach you use, some students will always struggle. So I never really found like I was getting those answers. And that's what led me after you know 13 years of working in public education, that's what led me down that road to um, wanting to become a school psychologist. I didn't leave teaching because I didn't like it anymore. And I still consider myself not, even though I'm not in the classroom, I'm very much still an educator. Um, you can't let go of that part of your of your background. I also taught in the regular classroom. I taught um, social studies for six years at the middle school level, and I taught communications and English, um, humanities, basically at the high school level as well. So I'm elementary trained, but I spent a lot of time working with students who had been through the elementary system and um, were struggling with, with reading and with literacy, with math as well, but literacy was definitely the, the more common um, denominator with students that came across my path. So I'm also a daughter, a sister, a wife, and a mom to two teens, an aunt to seven, and hopefully a friend to many, and many more maybe after today. Um, so our, that's just a little bit about me, so you understand my lens of where I'm coming from. Um, <clears throat> My goal in becoming a school psychologist was really to try to help promote, help support students, but also support my colleagues. I really felt um, stuck and I struggled as a teacher to try to help all of the students that, you know, the diversity in our classroom and classrooms that I was seeing and trying to make sure that um, everybody was getting what they needed. It's, it's a monumental task that we put in front of teachers and I understand it firsthand um, and so sharing my background is to let all of you know, let everyone in the audience know that I know where you are. I know where you've been. I understand how special education and education has come to this place that we're in now. I started in 1999. I was there when our contract language changed and we saw some changes to the way funding happens. Um, the chronic underfunding of special education in particular um, a big part of my job as a school psychologist is looking at designations and diagnosis and trying to um, 
try to maximize the system for, you know, as much as we have to be able to get that. I, I recognize that we have chronic underfunding. So all of the struggles and the things that you're dealing with in your classrooms on a day-to-day -day basis, I get it. Um, and I'm coming at this presentation and at my, my all of my background knowledge is a result of going through that, that same system. That's You're still a part of that world. Um, so as, as um, Dr. Garforth mentioned, I, I am currently a practicing school psychologist in School District 28 in Quenell. I work part-time there and I'm full-time as a faculty of education. I'm a lecturer in the School of Education. So I have a whole co cohort of teacher education students and I've been doing that since September. And my goal in doing that was to help bring some of this knowledge and this information that I have uncovered and become aware of since I became a school psychologist. I, I really felt after, you know, I, be, I became a school psychologist in 2012, started my master's in 2009 when I was living on Haida Gwaii. And um, it was through that process that I realized that I needed, I needed to get this information to teachers um, before they, they became even set foot in the classroom. Afterwards is obviously really important. We have a monumental task because we've got, we want our pre-service teachers to come out with this information, but we also need to build a knowledge base of our teachers who are already out there practicing. So wherever and however we can collectively provide that information is, is what I'm all about. And my, my leap going from K to 12 and working as a school psychologist, it wasn't easy to leave that because there's a huge shortage, as we all know. I don't have to probably tell anyone in this audience. Um, I didn't leave it lightly because I really care about what I do as a school psychologist. I think it's really important. Um, but at the same time, I know that a big part of what I do is about prevention and intervention. And there would be a lot fewer kids referred for assessment if we were doing some things differently at tier one. We've all heard that expression. You can't fix a tier. Uh, you can't. Inter get, provide interventions out of out of um, out of a tier one problem. So tier two doesn't fix a tier one problem. If we have issues going on with our general instruction, we are creating kids that have difficulties that maybe shouldn't have them. And so that's where we. What brings me here today is to help, hopefully, help everybody have a different understanding or deeper understanding of literacy development through a trauma and size of one lens. And to understand that our instructional and uh, assessment practices can either help or hinder literacy development and self-regulation. So I'm hoping by the end of this presentation, people will really see uh, the connection between literacy development or really academic development and self-regulation because they're both two sides of the same coin. They feed into each other. So I've tried to find the source of this lovely little diagram. It's from the Ministry of Education, this, the, um, uh, the site. Uh, the um, credit for it is on the next slide. This is the top of a poster, but I cannot find it for the life of me anymore. So if anybody knows where to access this little, this PDF, it's a poster. Um, and wants to put that link in the chat, that would be fantastic. I wasn't able to find it. Anyways, um, so we talk a lot and we hear, we get a lot of protein. We hear a lot about social emotional learning and trauma informed practices. It's kind of the buzzword in, in education right now. And for good reason. Um, so this is a, a poster that was put out by the Ministry of Education a few years ago, and it's talking about Brian. So giving some context. So this is Brian. He lives in an unpredictable world. He's never sure how his caregivers will respond. Each day is different. Brian has learned to be invisible when he needs to be and to fight when he has to stay safe. School is very different than his home environment. At school, Brian makes himself a bit invisible or fights when he's afraid because that is what Brian has learned to do. So the whole idea behind science and foreign practice is understanding that sometimes when students have behaviors that are challenging, it's a response, an involuntary response of things that are going on for them internally and, and as a result of what they've experienced in their lives to that point. We all, if you're an educator in today's classrooms, whether you're a principal, an education assistant, a teacher, it doesn't really matter what your background is in education. If you are in a public school today, you will have seen Brian you will have seen kids that look like him. Um, their, their behaviors that you can observe, maybe fear, maybe aggression, maybe excessive shyness. Um, some kids will disassociate. They'll have bodily symptoms. They genuinely get headaches or stomach aches whenever something is really challenging. Um, and they also can have a lot of hyperactivity. 
So all of these are responses to things that are actually going on in the brain. It's chemical reactions. The, the key pieces, parts of the brain that are involved with that are the prefrontal cortex. That's our, our working memory and where logic and region, reason live, our executive function. And I know that's a topic that's going to come up as well. Um, Dr. Garforth has a great session coming up on that. Um, our limbic system, which is our feelings, our emotions, our memories, and our brainstem. That's that basic reptilian brain, the fight, flight, or freeze, the thing that tells us to get out of the way when there's a saber-toothed tiger coming or a bus or whatever. The difficulty is, is that when children are triggered, these systems don't function properly. Um, and, and in our modern society, we get responses to threats as if it was a saber-toothed tiger, even though it's not. And so when think kids are dysregulated, that's that's a little bit about what's going on there. So being science informed, this is all about the science of the brain, is trauma informed. Like there are two, again, two sides of the same coin. So trauma informed is science informed practice. So when children are triggered, they are using their instinct and their emotional brain. So what do we do about that? One of the things we can do um, is making the unpredictable. Predictable, predictable. So having things like visual schedules, um, listing, um, making sure that we have really clear routines in our classroom. Um, often I get called in to not just do psychoeducational assessments, but to do observations for students who are struggling. Sometimes we may be thinking, school-based teams may be thinking that the student perhaps needs to be referred on for a more specialized assessment, um, like an autism assessment or a CDBC, a complex developmental behavior conditions assessment. Um, when I go in to do those observations, sometimes I see classrooms where there's a goal to give students a lot of voice and choice and have them, the children have a lot of autonomy, almost like a, a Montessori, you know, very discovery learning. And there's, a, there, there are definitely some benefits to that, um, for some children, but if you're a dysregulated child and your home environment is very unpredictable, you need a lot of predictability and stability in your environment because you're coming from a very dysregulated place, emotionally, physically in your brain and often in your physical environment at home. So having that predictability, the stability um, provides that sense of security and it reduces anxiety. It, it allows that higher functioning brain um, to be able to come online so that you can actually think ahead and plan ahead and keep yourself calm. When you're constantly trying to figure out where you're supposed to sit, how you're supposed to walk down the hallway. What does it look like when you are going into the gym to be part of an assembly? If we can make those things explicit for students, it provides that, that predictability and that stability for them. It's making things, making the implicit explicit is really helpful for children who have trauma. Um, <clears throat> often children with trauma are coming from very punitive environments. And this isn't to say that, that they don't have consequences when they come to school. Of course, they need consequences, but they need to be done within safe boundaries. Um, uh, there's, there's a real need for a sense of control as well with children who experience uh, a lot of trauma or have experienced trauma. We need to provide them choice where we can. And that doesn't mean that they get to do whatever they want all day. This is about providing choice within safe boundaries. So, for example, in the context of literacy, as a teacher, if you've done your assessment and you know that a student has not mastered all of their letters and sounds, they, of course, are going to need to master their letters and sounds. And you may have some decodable text that you want them to read. They can have a choice within those decodable text, but what they are focusing on in their literacy program or in their decodable text isn't their choice because that's directed by you and your knowledge of what that student needs. If they get to choose, if students constantly choose whatever they want to do and work on, they will choose to avoid what's hard. We all do that, right? We, nobody wants to come to school or to work. We don't choose careers that are innately difficult for us. If I had to go to work and um, you know catch a ball all day, I would not want that job. I've been hit with a ball more times than I've caught a ball in my lifetime. Um, so I avoid that task, right? Kids do the same thing. They avoid what's hard. Um, until they reach a point of success, right? So it's, it's our job to figure out that scaffolding piece and figure out where the right level is, that zone of proximal development, um, right, where the right area that they need to, what they need to be targeting on so they can have success and achieve mastery and then move on to the next level that's the most appropriate for them. So 
offering the child who is very controlling and has no control at home, um, needs that sense of control, offering them choice within those safe boundaries is completely appropriate and absolutely what they need. And they also need um, the language of emotion, right? We need to be able to show them love and teach them um, what their emotions are, teaching students how their bodies feel when they are stressed out, right? If you, want, if you talk to a child about what it feels like when they read and what, what it, how it is, um, how frustrating that is for them, you, you need to give them the language around that because often they don't even recognize it. They just shut down. They want to avoid that task, but they don't realize why they're shutting down and avoiding that task. So that's just a little bit about um, trauma in general and kind of starting to build that bridge into how it relates to literacy. And before we dive into that a little bit more deeply, I want to, um, we're going to talk about a couple of different models today. Um, I want to talk about the role of memory. Often I get teachers ask me, it just like, it seems like one day they have mastered something and the next day it's forgotten. Um, whether it's letter sounds or the means of words or their math facts or whatever it is, like something is going on with this kid's memory. They don't seem to be able to retrieve it or store it and all of that. So rather than me trying to explain this through slides, I am going to save my voice and have uh, a bit of a, uh, a break and drink some water and let you watch this short video on the role of memory and the different aspects of memory, um, because it's really important for making that link between trauma and learning and self-regulation. So let's see if we can bring this up. How Does Human Memory Work? by Academy of Learning Career College. This model provides a helpful framework for thinking about how memory works. Memory can be thought of as having three critical components. Sensory memory. Sensory memory takes information from the environment through the human senses, sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. Sensory memory can take a lot of information, but information is stored for only a very short time, with visual information being stored for less than half a second and auditory information being stored for only three to four seconds. Working memory. Working memory is what you are conscious of or what you are thinking about at any given moment. This is where the memory work happens. People can only handle a small amount of information in their working memory at one time. We cannot think about a million things at once. In fact, we can only hold about four things in our working memory at a time. We also cannot hold that information for very long. Working memory duration is about 5 to 20 seconds unless we actively try to remember information by repeating it. Long-term memory. Long-term memory is where we hold all our memories. One goal of learning is to get information into long-term memory so we can use it later when we need it. We have a lot of room to store memories, but the memories we store are not perfect representations of the outside world. Long-term memory is relatively permanent. However, if we want to maintain easy access to a memory, we need to retrieve that information regularly. What this means is that learning depends on three critical processes. Attention, encoding, and retrieval. Attention. To get new information into long-term memory, it must go through the working memory, and to get into working memory, we must pay attention to it. This means that attention and focus are the starting point for learning. If learners are not paying attention to course materials, they will not be able to process the information or remember it later. Distractions text messages, notifications, daydreaming, are not helpful for learning. Encoding. Once we are conscious of information in our working memories, we want to encode the information into long-term memory. Encoding is made easier when learners connect new information to what they already know. Information and processes are repeated. Information is assembled, structured, and organized. <coughs> It can help to think of your memory a little bit like a filing cabinet. It is easier to find things when they are filed away in an organized fashion. 
Information is translated from however it is originally seen and heard into something created by the learner. Retrieval Taking information out of long-term memory and into our conscious working memory so we can change our behavior. Retrieval gets easier when you practice. The more you retrieve something from long-term memory, the easier it becomes. People who have been tested on material are more likely to remember it later and apply it than people who only studied the material. Okay, so that's a little background about memory. Yeah, let me just get back to my PowerPoint. Um, just while you're sorting things out. Sure, um, yeah. Instead of people raising their hands, I, I noticed that we do have um, a raised hand uh, in the attendees, please type your questions uh, into the question and answer or into the chat and we will address them. Um, Eva, Jung, I'm not sure if you're aware that your hand is raised. Uh, but back to you, Mel. Okay, great. Just gonna get back to my spot here. There we go. Okay, so memory, as you just heard, is something that's um, really important for teachers to have. It, you don't have to have it, you know, burned into your brain about, you know, what all the different types of memory. And, and that's just a brief overview, right? We have episodic memory, we have a visual memory, verbal memory, all of these different aspects of memory. But those are really kind of the three key ones that, that are important for us to have some understanding about as educators because it has to do with this concept of cognitive load. Now, this is one of those things that could be a whole uh, presentation in and of itself, um, but I do want to speak to it a little, little bit, and I've put a link in here um, on uh, a resource if people want to go in and find out a little bit more about cognitive load theory. Um, and this is a, a resource that's written, it's from um, Australia, but it's written for teachers and it's quite user-friendly. So I would, uh, you can go ahead and, and I've, I've uh, passed on my PowerPoint to uh, Dr. Garforth, so she'll be able to share that and you can certainly access that link. Um, if for some reason you aren't able, you can always send me an email and I can send it on to you as well. Um, but the important thing to remember is that trauma really does affect our working memory and the ability to self-regulate. Self-regulation challenges for any reason, which include, so self-regulation is an inattentiveness, distractibility, self-direction, self-monitoring. Those are some of the key things um, that we think about when we think about self-regulation or executive function. Um, challenges in those areas make it really difficult for students to learn. So it doesn't matter why a student is having difficulty with self-regulation, whether trauma is at the root of it, of it, ADHD is at the root of it, it could be um, lack of sleep. Um, we all experience these challenges with our working memory and with our ability to self-regulate when we're going, we have ups and downs just as human beings. Um, any of you that are parents or have been uh, new parents in particular, when your sleep is deprived, your working memory goes down. As you get older, your working memory goes down. So that feeling when you, you leave a room and, or you, you walk into a room and then you can't remember why it is that you went in there and you have to go all the way back to wherever you were before you can figure that out. Um, those are kind of examples of everyday uh, working memory, but working memory is super important for all aspects of learning. And one of the things that, that came up in that video was the ability to attend. We remember what we think about. We remember what we pay attention to. So if you imagine your little wee ones that are, you know, kindergarten, grade one, grade two, grade three, however old they are in those primary grades, um, they're super wiggly. They're, they're not paying attention to what's going on for whatever reason. It could be trauma. It could be because they have ADHD. It could be for all kinds of reasons, but if they aren't attending to that early instruction and that's when you're providing the information about letter sound correspondences and phonological awareness and phonemic awareness and all those things that are um, super critical for foundational literacy skill development, if they are not in a place where they are able to pay attention to that in the setting that it's provided, they miss that and they need it. It's absolutely critical. So we have to find ways to go back. And that's tied to our assessment. We talked about, uh, Dr. Segal talked about assessment a fair amount um, in her presentation, and I'm not gonna speak to it a lot today, but it's really critical that um, we 
We are making sure that our assessments provide us with timely information about how our students are doing on the specific skills that lead to reading mastery. So if we don't know where, you know, have our students mastered all of their letters, all of their sounds, and the different spellings of, of the letters and sounds, as, as was mentioned, I-G-H is the, one of the ways to spell the long I sound. We have 26 letters, 44 sounds, 250 plus some odd ways to spell those sounds. Um, we have to be explicit about getting that information to our students. And if we don't know where they are on those skills, we we can't instruct them. We, we end up accommodating too soon. We provide supports. It's important to accommodate. It's important to provide readers and scribes and all of those things when students need them to accent, access content. But if we aren't also providing support for students to develop those missing skills, they will continue to have gaps. They don't just learn them by being exposed to, liter to literature. So we need to provide that direct instruction and that comes from our assessments that we're doing. Kids won't slip through the cracks if we know exactly where the breakdown is happening. And that's the importance of cognitive load. When students have to, um, it, it, the video mentioned um, the importance of practicing, right? Practicing and the more you practice and, re and retrieve information, the easier it is to recall. I often explain to students, as was mentioned in the video, your, your brain is like a, um, a filing cabinet. The more you open the drawer, the easier it is to open the drawer. But if you hardly ever open it, it gets stuck, right? And often students will describe to me, oh, I know that word, but I, I can't quite remember what it means, or I, I don't know how to put it into words. It's that tip of the tongue feeling that they have. Um, we want the ability to recall vocabulary or letter sound correspondences or whatever it is to be automatic, to be really fast and, and quick for kids so that they aren't spending any mental energy doing those things and they can spend their mental energy figuring out what it is that they're reading. They can then put the, the emphasis into comprehending the words that are on the text rather than putting all the mental energy into lifting the words off the page. So that's the importance of that early phonics and phonological awareness skill development in those early years. And if they don't develop in the early years, we have to go back and provide it. So that's where providing, um, finding tools and resources that are more age appropriate, but at the skill level that the student needs is super important. It doesn't mean that they're not getting instruction at their grade level and in their content area, but we have to find ways of building it in to boost up those skills. And we know that students, uh, people can learn to read at any age. Um, I would highly recommend if maybe somebody could put it in the chat. There's a, a video out of um, EBLE, uh, Effective Based Liter or Evidence Based Literacy Instruction. EBLE um, is a company out of the United States. And there's a, a video a documentary, a webinar with uh, David Chalk, who's from British Columbia. He learned to read in his 60s. Um, we can do this with, with people, with students, no matter how old they are. It's a matter of figuring out how to do it within our systems and our context that we have. And the more effective we are at doing it at the K to three level, the less students we're going to have that we need to go back and, and provide that remedial instruction for. So that's just a little bit about cognitive load. One of the best ways we can support cognitive load is through explicit instruction. It doesn't mean that kids never get to do discovery or inquiry. It just means that when they're novice with a skill, when they haven't mastered something yet, we need to be explicit about what it is that we want them to learn and model it and have them practice it. The more they practice it and retrieve it and have opportunities to practice it and retrieve it, the more likely they're going to be able to transfer that skill and be able to apply it in different settings. So this is good practice for all of our kids, but it's especially essential for kids who are dealing with trauma or who have self-regulation challenges. So this is another um, model that I want to um, just put into people's realm. I'm not going to have us watch this video just because I'm aware of the time. Um, I've got 19 minutes left and I still have a lot that I want to get through. But if you're not familiar with Yuri Braun from Brenner's work, he's a, a psychologist um, that uh, developed this bioecological model of human development. And for me, it's a very powerful model. It helps me to understand and make sense of what's going on for kids in a very holistic way. So at the center of this model is the individual, it's the child. And that's where we can consider biological factors. Um, we know that, that students have common um, 
common things that go on in their brain. They all have an amygdala. They all have a prefrontal cortex. They all have different regions of the brain that are involved in reading. And that's the same for all of them. There's nothing new um, about those structures being involved in reading. And it doesn't matter what culture you're from, where you're from, those processes happen in every single human brain when we learn, whether it's learning to read or learn, learning to do math or whatever it is. So we have some commonalities, but also at the individual level, you're going to have differences. We have differences in, in um, uh, uh, health conditions, for example, um, the ability to self-regulate, whether or not you have a disability going on or a medical condition. Those are all things that affect the individual. And then the microsystem is all the things around that individual. So where they go to school, what kind of family they come from, what their neighborhood is like. So this is all the socioeconomic status. And then the meso system is that interaction between those things. Does the family um, uh, have a good relationship with the school and with the teachers? Um, is are the peers that the student goes to school with? Do they also live in that in that child's neighborhood, or are they isolated when they go home? So that's what we mean by microsystem and the interaction is the meso system between those things, and then the exo system is the bigger service, uh, bigger. Um, um, yeah, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, big, <laughs> the bigger um, issues or, or uh, networks around the students. So their neighbors, the legal, legal services, uh, friends of the family, what's surrounding that student that, that provides their social network. And then the macro system is the attitudes and ideologies of the culture. So where are they growing up? Are they, are they in Canada? Are they, where in Canada are they? Are they living rurally? Are they in an indigenous community? Are they um, an immigrant that's new to the culture that they're living in? All of those things. And then we have this chrono system as well. And the chrono system is what happens over time, the socio-historical conditions. So when we think about things like residential schools and the impact of residential school and the idea of historical trauma, and even if you didn't experience the trauma, the trauma firsthand, you are experiencing the effects of that trauma through your parents or your grandparents. All of these things help us to understand students and give us a more complete holistic picture of what's going on. So my point in telling you that is to just let you know that even though I'm a psychologist, really kids are much more than test scores. A holistic assessment approach is what I'm all about. This is a diagram that I include in um, my assessment reports that I do um, because I got to the point where I was constantly having to explain to, to teachers and to parents that it's, uh, you know, I would be asked, can you just tell us what the designation is? Tell us what the diagnosis is. What, what are the standard scores? It's not that black and white. You have to consider the test scores are only meaningful within the context of that whole child. And if you, for example, if I do an assessment um, and I have a student who is presenting with sig significant challenges in their verbal ability, for example, but when I review the report cards and I talk to their family and I talk to their teachers, the teacher is telling me that, no, they're, they're like, their hand is always up. They're always chatty. They really, you know, are engaged and they know what's going on. And I see that reflected in the report cards. I'm going to know that on that given day, that child was either not feeling well, or they didn't feel comfortable enough with me or whatever. Like I wouldn't proceed with an assessment unless I, unless I was comfortable with the child, but I'm using as a, that as an example that, um, the test scores can be wrong, right? So we need to make sure that what we are seeing on any given day, that snapshot of that child on any given day, fits with the whole context of who that child is from multiple sources of information. So that's um, uh, well, one piece. Sorry, can I just interrupt? I wanna make sure that you have your code word and your QR code in this presentation, otherwise I can insert them. I do, they're at the end. I wasn't okay. sure the best to put it, but I thought I would put it at the end so that if people were with me until the end, then they would get it. <laughs> Great. Sounds awesome. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Um, so what does trauma have to do with reading? Um, hopefully that's becoming apparent. This is a, a, a quote. Oh, I have an extra quotation at the end there <laughs> um, from uh, Dr. Stephen Dykstra, who um, has done some amazing work. I put in the link where this is from. And he says, the, the research shows that the single most powerful predictor of children's ability to overcome trauma and survive their circumstances is the ability to read. 
if they can read, they have a chance to find success in school and overcome all those terrible things in their lives. If they can't, school will only become another source of pain and failure added to all the other sources of pain and failure. And this is something that I have definitely witnessed over my 23 years of experience. I've reviewed hundreds of files, conducted hundreds of assessments, and worked one-to-one -one and in small group and in classrooms with students who have struggled to read. And the students, it doesn't matter how many letters I have behind my name, the students are the ones that, that teach us that it is way better to look bad than it is to look stupid. They would rather get kicked out. They would rather stop coming to school. It is horrible to be an older student and have and not be able to work independently, to have to have an adult or technology um, in order to be able to function day to day. Um, it's, it is traumatic. And so trauma impedes reading, but it also, reading difficulties also cause trauma for a lot of students, even if they don't have those. So I won't, I won't dive into this too much. Again, Dr. Segal did such a wonderful job of talking about the actual research, um, but I just want to, to reiterate that my lived experiences and all of the data, which she touched on as well, there's some links here if you want to find out a little bit more about that um, when we talk about literacy being a social justice issue and how closely tied this is to things like prison rates and lack of unemployment, uh, lack of employment, underemployment, all of these things, incarceration, lower paying jobs, dropping out of school. These are all things that I've witnessed um, that I think many of us witness. And it, it can look like students are on the right trajectory for reading, but they actually aren't. And, and when they leave the primary grades, if they don't have those foundational skills, that, that's when the gaps really start to show up. It's in the intermediate and secondary grades. And often the students are gone from, from um, their, their primary teacher's um, realm. And so you don't always know that what if what you're doing has actually been as effective as you think it has. There's, there's no way to actually make that direct correlation. So we, we can't control what happens outside of school. Like that, that's very clear, but we can control much of what happens inside. So when we have breakfast and lunch programs, when we have school clubs, social emotional learning um, um, practices in our schools, counseling, mindfulness, culturally relevant and appropriate practices, UDL, inclusive education, all of these things are helpful and relationships are the foundation of all of them. So we're talking a lot about reading instruction. There, in no way does that mean that you don't know your kids, you don't know your students, and that you don't have a positive rapport with them. Because if you don't have that, it doesn't matter what you're trying to teach them. So all of the, the information that you're going to hear over the next two days is coming from the assumption that you have a positive rapport and you know who your students are. That relationship is absolutely first and foremost. When we combine all of these things, with science-informed, empirically supported models of literacy development and instruction, we are more likely to effectively address the problems when kids struggle with reading and writing, and we lessen the impacts of adverse childhood events in the long run. So whether, whether we're dealing with you know, kids that have been through divorce, kids that have moved frequently, kids that have witnessed violence at home or experienced violence at home directly, doesn't matter what the issue is, we can remediate those better when we are looking at the child holistically and through a scientific and science-informed lens. So who has uh, low literacy? This has been mentioned as well. We know that about 95% of individuals can learn to read. And again, I've put a link in there. <laughs> You'll see that I'm, I'm all about links because none of this is the end of the information. There's so much information out there and there's more than I can provide in, in an hour. Um, so do you know? feel free to go and explore those documents that I've left in there. Um, I do want to point out, though, that in British Columbia um, and Canada, but in British Columbia in particular, Indigenous students, students of First Nation heritage, students and students who have special needs are disproportionately represented among students who demonstrate low, low literacy. Now, I know our FSA scores are contentious, um, but they are what they are. And, and I put the link in there if you wanted to go in and look and see, you, you can't unsee <laughs> um, what the data, that data in particular shows us, but it, it parallels what I've seen firsthand in schools as well. <clears throat> so the literate brain, these are just some different parts of, of the brain that are involved in reading. We have kind of four main regions, but there's, these are specifically some areas that are, that are involved. Um, 
the MRI studies, when we talk about the science behind why we know what we know and how we know what we know, the science is evolving. It's, it's always going to continue to evolve. And, and as we learn more and more about the brain um, and how the brain learns to read, um, you, you, th there's more specific information about what we can do to be more effective in our reading instruction. But we know with certainty what parts of the brain are involved. And that's consistent over time. So I've got two video links here. Um, I want to show you uh, just the short two minute one because we don't have time to watch the other one, but I would encourage you again to go back. Um, and many of you maybe have already seen these videos as well too, but I'll show the short uh, two minute one to give my voice a break. Um, and then we'll jump back into the next one. And then this one is um, the second seven minute one is um, about uh, the work of Stanislas Dehaene. And it's uh, pretty phenomenal if you're interested in the, the nerdy uh, science stuff about MRI studies. It's, it's a good place to start. But let's see what another uh, guru has to say, um, Mark Seidenberg. Oh, I have to stop sharing here. Hang on. As far as we know, the brain organization for reading is there. There's, there's one, there aren't multiple ways the brain is, can be structured to read. Now, there are differences in skill, there are differences in how well developed these systems are. It's not that everyone is identical, but we don't find evidence that people's brains can be organized in very different ways and yet still support skilled reading. So yes, there do seem to be certain universal properties of how reading works in the brain, but it's not that the brains of the person reading Mandarin are different from the brains of the person who's reading English. This question of whether the same brain system underlies different writing system is relevant also to the question of uh, individual differences among children who are learning, for example, English. So educators are, just have a pretty firm belief that every kid is different and that, you know, the challenge of teaching is to be able to spend tailor your instruction for the needs of the child and their learning style the way that they happen to happen to um, happen to learn best. Um, we don't find that when we study the computational and behavioral and neural systems that underlie reading. We, we find that there's a lot more commonality than there are differences. There are differences in skill. There are differences in how much experience kids have had. There are differences in how helpful their instruction has been. But we don't find that their brains of the children are organized in highly idiosyncratic ways that mean that one child will learn to read one way and another child will learn to read another way. The, 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 it could have been that way. That's how the research could have turned out, but it just, it just hasn't. So I wanted to just show that video because it um, really brings home <coughs> the idea that um, I often hear, you know, there's, there's, there's all kinds of ways that kids learn to read, but hopefully you're getting the sense, if, if you didn't have that sense already, that there's actually, the brain is wired to learn to read and to master, it's not wired to learn. Oh, hang on. I'm sure that's lovely, but I want to watch that right now. Sorry, let's get rid of that. Okay. Um, yeah, there's, um, the research is quite clear that um, there are the same kinds of uh, brain uh, processes involved in the brain when, when we learn to read. And um, there are certain things that we can do in the classroom to facilitate that because we have this understanding of the ways that we can bring these aspects of the brain online to be able to master reading. We know that some things that we do enable that to happen more quickly than other ways. And so that's where this other video kind of gives you a, a more visual 
uh, representation of that. There's another short video here that you can you can watch as well. This is the simple view of reading, which I'm sure you're probably um, either familiar with or um, will be familiar with by the end of the symposium. So basically, um, the simple view of reading says that language comprehensions, our ability to understand words and meaning and language, um, times our ability to decode words and sound them out equals reading comprehension. So if you have a breakdown on either aspect of that, it's going to impact your reading comprehension. When we do um, um, assessments for reading disorders, this is how the diagnostic manual is actually set up. We are assessing for language comprehension. So background knowledge, vocabulary, all of these different aspects um, we can assess for. You don't have to do it through a psych ed, mind, mind you. Um, and then word recognition. So these aspects weaving together is how we get skilled reading. In education, what we tend to do is jump right to reading comprehension and focus on reading comprehension skills and strategies without looking at the learning progression. We really need to tease out and understand what leads to reading comprehension. And that's what Scarborough's Rope is really helpful in helping teachers to be able to visualize. Um, the more I go into classrooms, I'm starting to see these reading ropes up on the wall um, and being able to uh, talk and, and in schools, being able to um, explain to students when they have difficulty with reading, if it's a problem with this aspect, it helps to justify why they need to keep focusing on sounding out those words and blending and getting fluent with whatever aspect they are working on. Or if you're working on vocabulary and helping students to be able to access um, the meanings of words and playing games with that and being highly interactive and explicit with those uh, with vocabulary development or background knowledge, the reason for that is so that they can become even better readers. Both of those things are essential for that. I did, wanted to include a little bit of a, 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 just a bell curve here. When we talk about the number of students that are struggling to read, we should be dealing with 5% or, or less of students, right? So when we think about IQ, if 70 is um, considered an intellectual disability for your, if your adaptive functioning and your intellectual ability has a standard score of 70 or lower, you can be considered as um, having, sometimes there's a bit of wiggle room to be up 75, but anyway, that's a whole other protein as well. Um, uh, but what we're seeing is that we have far more greater numbers of students who are struggling with, with reading it in, um, far more than, than what the, the research indicates that they should. So we see students hit this great, uh, this uh, slump, and I realize I'm at 12 o'clock now already here. I was worried my voice wouldn't hold out, but really it's just that I, you know, have way too much to say. <laughs> um, but this is something I see. I do, I do want to wrap things up. The slide, the slides will be there and people can finish them off as well um, on their own. Um, but yeah, definitely I see students hit that, that level of grade four or five. Um, and that's when the reading really shifts from being able to learn to read from uh, being able, learning to read to being able to learn from what they're reading. And that's where they hit that wall. So when they have strong verbal abilities, sometimes that can be later, but a lot of the time, this is where they hit that. So word decoding definitely matters. And the weight fail model is so unnecessary. We don't need a psych ed to figure out what kids need to be able to provide better instruction. And yes, the school psychologist is telling you that. Um, there's a bottleneck because of the way that we teach reading. And I truly believe that we would have far shorter wait lists if we changed our tier one instruction. Um, and we're focusing on being more preventative and providing interventions at those early years. We wouldn't have kids being referred on for psychology assessments nearly as much as we do right now. It's embedded in our, our curriculum as people have mentioned. So this is right from our BC curriculum. Does it look right? Does it sound right? This is what's known as the three queuing system. We encourage students to use strategies that increase their cognitive load, that it doesn't detract from it. And we really need to, to make sure that we're moving towards removing this from our BC curriculum and from the strategies that teachers are being told are effective. It's not phonics only, as you will see over the next couple of days, we're gonna have some phenomenal presentations of what's going on in classrooms that show you what I, everything I've talked about actually looks like on the ground. Um, we've got amazing people in BC making this happen. So um, I'm really looking forward to seeing that uh, with alongside all of you. Um, and there's no pendulum to swing. Like 
there, I hear a lot, oh, well, we're just going back to phonics. Really, we aren't. It, you need both. You need phonics and you need language development and you need phonemic awareness. There are no reading wars because the scientific evidence is really clear. Whole language methods, including three cueing and memorization of whole words, are not supported by scientific evidence. So we need to find ways to move away from them and support our teachers to develop some other tools. So closing the gap between research and practice, um, this is what we're, we're, we're moving towards. It's really hard to let go of what you believe. Um, there's real trauma around that. I've developed uh, stages of grief for educators, um, but as a genuine, I've been through them myself and still go through them. It, it's hard to accept that what you've been doing may not be as effective as you hoped it was for uh, a good chunk of your students. So we've got to work together to help bridge that gap. And um, yeah, thank you very much for listening.